on World News Tonight. On alert. India warns its nationals residing in Canada to be on alert as the relations between the two countries turn sour. Strike announced. Apple Store employees in France calls a national strike, coinciding with the new iPhone 15 launch. Human trials. Elon Musk's Neuralink receives approval to recruit humans for brain implant trial. Brazil buzz. Exhibition kicks off in Rio de Janeiro, showcasing art and technology. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We have an array of stories lined up for you tonight. We start this Thursday night with more updates on the India-Canada tensions. India tells citizens in Canada to exercise caution as relations worsen between the two countries in an escalating row over the murder of Sikh separatist leader Hardeep Singh Nijar. New Delhi laid down a warning on Wednesday to Indian nationals in Canada, and in particular, hundreds of thousands of students, exercise utmost caution. The advisory marks another sign of unraveling ties between the two countries in an escalating dispute over the murder of a Sikh separatist leader. Ottawa insists Canada is safe. You have got to call them. The travel advisory follows an earlier tit-for-tat expelling of diplomats. A Canadian citizen on Canadian soil. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said Canada is investigating credible allegations that Indian government agents were involved in the June murder of Hardeep Singh Nijjar. India categorically rejects the assertions. It labeled Nijjar a terrorist years ago. On Wednesday, India's main opposition Congress party endorsed the government's position. We're seeing a tit for tat on both sides. Its leader Shashi Tharoor says Canada's going public has put the country's relationship in jeopardy. I think it's unfortunate that Canada chose such a public route. Going public, making a statement in Parliament and so on was very unfortunate. Meanwhile, in Punjab's holy city of Amritsar, some six called for clarity on the issue and calm. Solution, milke ke baat karni for a solution, they need to sit and talk. Basically, that's the only way said this retired businessman. Protests unfolded among Sikhs in neighboring Pakistan, with protesters calling for India to be held to account. We want justice! The White House says it's deeply concerned about the allegations and is encouraging India to cooperate in any investigation. There's not much support left for the insurgency in India. But small groups of six in Australia, Britain, Canada and the U.S. still support the separatist demand. New Delhi has long urged Canada to act against it. As for the killing, Canadian officials have not elaborated on why they think India is involved. Meanwhile, in the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak watered down Britain's plans to tackle climate change and he would delay a ban on sales of new petrol cars to maintain the constant of the British people in the switch to net zero. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak rolled back the UK's climate goals on Wednesday. He says previous governments moved too quickly to set net zero targets without public consent. To give us more time to prepare, I'm announcing today that we're going to ease the transition to electric vehicles. You'll still be able to buy petrol and diesel cars and vans, until 2035. Even after that, you'll still be able to buy and sell them secondhand. But his U-turn went beyond electric vehicles. So I'm announcing today that we will give people far more time to make the necessary transition to heat pumps. I'm confident that we can adopt a more pragmatic, proportionate and realistic approach to meeting net zero that eases the burdens on working people. Britain was the first major economy to create a legally binding 2050 net zero target, and emissions have fallen almost 50 percent since 1990. Sunak says that puts Britain ahead of other major economies. But the government's own independent climate advisor said Britain isn't doing enough to hit targets, and said that Wednesday's announcement will likely take it further away from being able to meet its legal commitments. Businesses, too, producing everything from cars to solar panels, criticized Sunak's move. 
But with a national election expected next year, Sunak appears to be betting that scaling back some green policies will win over voters who are struggling with stubbornly high inflation and stagnant economic growth. Over in the U.S., the FED says its key borrowing rates will remain steady. But the FED chair, Jerome Powell, is hinting at a rate hike later this year as its battle against inflation is not over yet. Following a two-day Federal Open Market Committee meeting, the U.S. Fed on Wednesday decided to freeze its key interest rates in the 5.25 percent to 5.50 percent range. The latest rate freeze marks just a second time the central bank has decided to leave its key borrowing rates unchanged since aggressive rate hikes first began in March 2022 in an effort to bring inflation down to its target of 2 percent. The U.S. Fed said its latest decision to freeze rates is in line with its goals of achieving maximum employment and dampening inflation to 2 percent over the long run. In a press release, the U.S. Central Bank said that recent indicators showed that economic activities has been expanding at a solid pace and that while job gains have slowed in recent months but remain strong, the employment rate has remained low. It also added that the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. Meanwhile, during a press conference, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell hinted at the likelihood of another rate hike down the road. Today, we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Looking ahead, we are in a position to proceed carefully in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate. Unions at Apple's store in France have called for a strike on Friday and Saturday, demanding better pay and working conditions. The action comes at an inconvenient time for the U.S. tech giant as it's due to launch its new iPhone 15. Unions at Apple's stores in France have called for a strike on Friday and Saturday. They are demanding better pay and working conditions. The action comes as an inconvenient time for the U.S. tech giant as it's due to launch its new iPhone 15. One union member told French media that Apple France workers could mobilise in three quarters of Apple's stores in the country. Apple France could not be immediately reached for comment. It's the latest tough break for the company in France. Last week, the French government suspended sales of iPhone 12 handsets. It did so after it said tests found breaches of radiation exposure limits. Apple pledged to update software on iPhone 12s in France to settle the dispute. But further worries in other European countries suggested it may have to take similar action elsewhere. Moving on to our election segment, Road to the White House Now. Ron DeSantis said if elected as the president, he would not pay for further coronavirus vaccines for Americans. The comment comes as DeSantis has ramped up his attacks in recent weeks on former President Donald Trump, the front-runner for the GOP presidential nomination, over his administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As a presidential candidate, DeSantis has regularly warned that mandates and restrictions would return if the government is given the opportunity. And the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced that it's awarded more than $1.4 billion towards the development of new vaccines and therapies as part of the $5 billion project NextGen initiative. DeSantis doubled down on recent guidance from his state to call aging anyone under 65 from getting them, contradicting federal health officials' recommendations. The governor said the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention cannot be trusted as a response that elicited a prolonged on-air clarification about the scientific evidence supporting the efficiency of coronavirus vaccines. DeSantis, in an interview, dismissed recent criticism from Republican donors who appear increasingly disenchanted by the Florida Republican after reporting his re-election. Welcome back. U.S. President Joe Biden and Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met on the sidelines of UNGA. This meeting signals a desire to erase strains in the U.S.-Israel relationship while pushing for a potential grand bargain with Saudi Arabia. 
U.S. President Joe Biden and Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly in New York on Wednesday. And although the allied country's relationship is strained, the leaders are also pushing what they're calling a potential grand bargain with a third country, Saudi Arabia, that they say could reshape the Middle East. Saudi Arabia and Israel are adversaries. Biden and Netanyahu say they're working to end that. Even where we have some differences, my commitment to Israel, as you know, is ironclad. I, uh, I think without Israel, there's not a Jew in the world that's secure. Joe, uh, we've been uh, friends for, I've checked it, over 40 years. Under your leadership, Mr. President, we can forge a historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And I think such a peace would go a long way first to uh, advance the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, achieve reconciliation between the Islamic world and the Jewish state, and advance a genuine peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, this is uh, something within our reach. Protests against the leaders' meeting took place in Tel Aviv and New York the same day. The U.S. and Israel have been at odds over Netanyahu's controversial judicial reforms and hardline stance on Palestinian issues, which Biden says he raised at the meeting. Netanyahu's shown little willingness to make major concessions to the Palestinians, which could make it hard for Saudi Arabia to agree to normalizing their relationship. A senior U.S. official said any potential deal is a long way off and would require hard choices by all parties. South Korea's President Yoon suk Yeol, as widely expected, raised concern over potential cooperation between North Korea and Russia on the weapons front at the UN podium in New York. President Yoon suk Yeol says a reform may be due for the United Nations' most powerful body on global security, expressing Seoul's firmest stance yet against Russia's potential arms cooperation with North Korea and its ongoing invasion of Ukraine. In a speech to the United Nations General Assembly on Wednesday, Yoon said if Pyongyang acquires the information and technology needed to enhance its weapons of mass destruction in exchange for supplying Moscow with conventional weapons, this would amount to a direct provocation threatening the peace and security of both Ukraine and South Korea. He said so its allies and its partners will not stand idly by. A presidential official told reporters there could be various economic, diplomatic and military pressure points to block Russia and North Korea from substantial arms cooperation. Yoon further said the call to reform the Security Council would receive broad support. The Security Council's five permanent members include Russia and China, with both countries critically hindering collective action with their veto powers. The idea of expanding the representation of non-permanent member countries or removing the right to veto has been gaining currency, with the leaders of the United States, Japan, Ukraine and the European Union endorsing the move in their own General Assembly speeches this year. A UN official said the president was pointing out how the Security Council's gridlock has directly affected South Korea's security and the impact of the Ukraine war to spur worldwide crises in food, energy and economic security. As a non-permanent member of the United Nations for a two-year term beginning next year, Yoon expressed his intention to take a responsible and principled role in international peace and security. The Camp David security cooperation system between South Korea, the US and Japan will be in active operation, dealing with international security issues such as the North Korean nuclear issue and the Ukraine war. Furthermore, Yoon reiterated his pledge to roll out comprehensive support for Ukraine under Seoul's Ukraine Peace and Solidarity Initiative and development assistance of around 2.3 billion US dollars in long-term low-interest loans for reconstruction projects. An interesting tech update now. Billionaire entrepreneur Elon Musk's brain ship startup, Neuralink, said it has received approval from an independent review board to begin recruitment for the first human trial of its brain implant for paralysis patients. Elon Musk's brain chip startup Neuralink says it has received approval to begin recruiting patients for its first human trial. An independent review board has given the green light for the company to seek people with paralysis to test its experimental device in a six-year study. The study will use a robot to surgically place a brain-computer interface, or BCI, implant 
in a region of the brain that controls the intention to move. Neuralink says the initial goal is to enable people to control a computer cursor or keyboard using their thoughts alone. Musk has grand ambitions for this medical device company, saying it would facilitate speedy surgical insertions of its chip devices to treat conditions like obesity, autism, depression and schizophrenia. The first two applications we're going to aim for in humans um, are restoring uh, vision. And uh, the, the, I think this is like notable in that even if someone has never had vision ever, like they were born blind, we, we believe they can, they, they can, we can still restore vision. And then the, uh, the other application being in the motor cortex, uh, where we would initially enable someone who has no, almost no ability to operate their, their muscles and um, enable them to operate their phone faster than someone who has ha working hands. In May, the company said it had received clearance from the US Food and Drug Administration for its first in-human clinical trial. Its previous testing in animals is under federal scrutiny for potential animal welfare violations. Iranian lawmakers have passed legislation to toughen penalties for women who do not wear a mandatory headscarf in public. Now, Iran's parliament has adopted a new law that toughens penalties for women not following the Islamic dress code. If the law gets final approval from the Guardian Council, it will be implemented for a trial period of three years. Under the changes, women not wearing headscarves or long, loose-fitting clothing could face up to 10 years in prison. The bill also punishes businesses serving women not wearing a headscarf properly and those who protest it. A growing number of women in Iran have stopped covering their hair recently. This follows a nationwide protest a year ago of the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini. She died in the custody of Iran's morality police last year after being arrested for allegedly not wearing her hijab correctly. Welcome back. For more news, let's stay here on the world in a minute. World War I cemeteries in Belgium and France, the hills of Rwanda's 1994 genocide and a former torture centre in Argentina have been declared UNESCO World Heritage Sites as the UN agency and a moratorium on memorial sites for human suffering. At least seven people were injured in a Russian attack on the central Ukrainian city of Jersky. China's Hong Kong completed construction of its first high-resolution remote sensing AI satellite. It is set for launch in the November of this year. The search for victims of the catastrophic flood that hit Libya's den are continuing for the second week, with a team from the UAE helping on the ground. Pope Francis is set to become the first pope to visit the southern French city of Marseille since Pope Clement in 15. After his arrival, he will be welcomed by French President Emmanuel Macron. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in Brazil as the first edition of a biennial Rio de Janeiro exhibition showcasing 17 interactive works that fuse art and technology. Thank you for watching. Good night.